Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to a school of evangelism. The focus of this school is the first part of the grand command of our Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples of all the nations. The second part, of course, is to teach them to observe whatever God has commanded. Now, the first part is like the foundation or the infrastructure. If you do not have a road, you cannot drive on it. So evangelism is the first part, and that is under the leadership of an evangelist. And the second part is teaching to observe the, whatever God commands in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation under the leadership of the pastor teacher. Now the content is training in evangelism. And when you train in evangelism, it is one third in the classroom, what we are doing right now, and two thirds in the field. And the aim of the School of Evangelism is to create an evangelism culture. And an evangelism culture has two aspects. First of all, you must have a burden for evangelism. And that is rather rare today. And secondly, you must have a burden for the glory of God. Because whenever a soul comes out of darkness, then God, for all pr practical purposes, thumbs his nose at Satan. God is the victor. Secondly, a burden for obedience. I learned many years ago because the grand command is a command that evangelism is part of our sanctification. So it is part of our obedience. Now the third burden is the burden for souls. And frankly, when you have a burden for souls, you hear the anguished cries of people in hell before they get there and then plead with God that he will use us so that we can prevent them from ever getting there. That is the burden for souls. But none of those elements can ever become a reality until we bathe ministers, quote unquote, as well as ministries in prayer. Daniel prayed for 12 hours when he saw the promise of God that Israel would return. Nehemiah prayed for days. Anna prayed for up to 50 years for the Redeemer to come. And the disciples prayed for 10 days for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. <coughs> Prayer is the soil from which ministers and ministries will thrive. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is where I would like to make a start. Now, when we talk about prayer, we talk about three elements. We talk about the content of prayer. What do we pray? And we find that in the Lord's Prayer, which also shares with us a burden for evangelism. In Matthew 6, verse 9 and following. Then secondly, the manner of prayer, and we see this in the Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman, and she has a burden for souls. So what we are going to talk about, a burden for evangelism and a burden for souls, is already in this session on prayer, the content and the manner. That is the first session. And in the second session, talks about the quality of prayer. But I intend to talk about that later. So let us pray. Father God, as we will deal now with the subject of prayer, as we find it in the Word of God specifically in the Lord's Prayer, 
I plead with you that your Holy Spirit will open our ears as well as our mouths, Lord, that we'll be able to share the word and that we will hear the word and that our hearts will be burning within us when we share and our hearts will be burning within us when we hear. That is our plea. For then, O oh Lord, we will take action and we will become the prayer warriors that we should be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I shared with you already that Daniel prayed for 12 hours, that Nehemiah prayed for days, that Anna prayed for 50 years, and that the apostles prayed for 10 days, but I have not yet shared with you that our Lord Jesus has been praying for centuries and we must follow in his footsteps. Now at one time the disciples came to Jesus and he said, teach us to pray. Now we know what the Lord Jesus told them. He told them the Lord's prayer. There are nine sections according to the King James Version and I'll stick to that. Now you know the first three, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, etc. And I would like to ask you a question from the very beginning. Is this a ritual that you pray or is it a reality? That's number one. The second question, when we talked about the Canaanite woman, is are we sitting in the stands and applauding her, or are we with her in the arena of prayer? So ask yourself the question, and from zero to 100, you can grade yourself, all right? And that is the whole purpose, because when the word of God comes, we do not read the word, but the word reads us. And if we are below par, then we have to go up to par. And we can only do that through prayer too. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make a beginning. The Lord Jesus says, hallowed be your name. Now what does that mean? Now first of all, when the Lord Jesus addresses the Father in John 17, he calls him Holy Father, not loving Father, not merciful father, not good father, and these are all true, fully, fully, fully true. He calls them Holy Father. And when you call God Holy Father, you become God-centered. And that's why he says, hallowed be your name. Let the sum total of your perfections, that is the name, his goodness, his holiness, his immutability, his omnipresence, etc., etc., etc. Let that form a canopy over this whole earth. Because when the Bible says, on earth as it is in heaven, that applies to all three of the first petitions. So put a canopy of your name over this whole earth, over the White House, over Salt Lake, over Beijing, over Moscow, it doesn't make any difference, over our home, over our bedroom, over our bank account. Put the name of yourself, O oh God, over everything. That is the only thing needful, as the Lord Jesus says to Martha about her sister. Now put that canopy there, Lord, over everything. Now we mean that. We say to the Lord, if it is a reality, and let me stay under that canopy. Let me not go to the left, let me not go to the right. Not even like David, who committed adultery and murder, and he got away with it. Let me stay under that canopy, oh my God. Keep me under that canopy. Keep me under that canopy. And we must pray that every day. And then we pray, your kingdom come. Now, as you know, I cannot take every petition and go into great detail, 
I only want to give you the thrust of the Lord's Prayer. What do you mean by you say that your kingdom come? It is always a ritual in the past, possibly. But if you really mean what you say, you say, Lord, we regenerate people. Lord, regenerate people. Lord, regenerate people. Lord, regenerate people. Lord, regenerate your people to your glory as a matter of our obedience. And also because if you don't regenerate them, they're hell bound forever. Regenerate people, regenerate people, regenerate people. And if you mean it as a reality, you say, use me, 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 use me. And then the third one, you will be done. Sanctify people. Sanctify them, Lord. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. Under every part of that canopy. Sanctify them in Salt Lake City. Regenerate and sanctify them in Salt Lake City. In the White House. In every little village. In the bedroom. Over the bank account. Lord, regenerate and sanctify them. Now, when you talk about regeneration, you share the gospel. And we'll talk about that later. When you sanctify the people, then you share the word from Genesis to Revelation. And come to think about it, out of this Lord's Prayer comes the grand command. Lord, put the canopy of your name over everything. Make disciples, make disciples, make disciples. Lord, train them, train them, train them, and use us to stay under that canopy. Use us in evangelism and use us in sharing the word. That is a reality. Now I'm going to ask you a simple question. How often have you prayed like that? I'll tell you, there's a lady who shakes her head, and I love that, you know, she what she means to say is, never, <laughs> never. And that is the problem in the church. And when Martha says to Jesus, I am ready to prepare lunch, and uh, there are people, and I'm not able to put the lunch up on time, and there's a sister of mine who always sits at your feet, Tell her to get up and help me. Now, I would have said, Martha, you have a point. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, it can be a kindness and it can be a rebuke. I think it's both. Because John says that he loved Martha. All right? I think it's both. I said, Martha, Martha, your sister does the only thing needful. Now, wait a minute. Don't I need uh, bread and uh, food? Don't I need uh, water to drink? Don't I need garments to clothe myself in? Don't I need school fees to go to school? Don't I, don't, I, don't I need a car if I want to work? I said, no, you don't need it. I said, well, what if I die? Well, you simply die 50 years earlier. <laughs> but you're going to die anyway. So, and if you go to Jesus, <laughs> You don't need it, right? If the church would say, I don't need any of it, then you begin to understand the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus to Martha, nobody is going to take that away from your sister. Not Satan, not I, and not you. You're distracted. Wow. And that's why you're worried. And that's why you yell. Have you ever noticed when you're worried if you're first distracted and then you begin to yell? She washes my she is there sitting at my feet. And later on, just before the death of Jesus, she washes the feet of Jesus. First of all, Jesus says to Martha, you're a believer, leave her alone. And when she washes the feet of Jesus with ointment that is worth close to a year's salary. Judas says, well, this could have been sold to give it to the poor. And he was a thief. He would take his 10% or so, or maybe even more. And then Jesus says to the unbeliever, leave her alone. I promise you, if you don't sit at the feet of Jesus, you will not wash the feet of Jesus. And all of a sudden, that, that first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer, 
are like a Mount Everest. It's awesome. And then, what do we find? Give me today my daily bread. Well, if we evangelize, we climb the hill of souls, right? If we share the word, we climb the hill of holiness. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these are Mount Everest. And you know why? Because we cannot convert people. And we cannot make people holy. So without the egg oxygen tank of Jesus and the Holy Spirit on our back, we will never get to the top. Now let me ask you a question. When you climb on Mount Everest, how much luggage do you take with you? <laughs> huh? To be honest. I know a man who said, I don't mind to go to Africa, but I need an American toilet. <laughs> and I said to myself, well, that's what the Apostle Paul says. I don't mind to do anything, but I need an American toilet wherever I go on my journeys. And I have a second one uh, somewhere in the storage place in case the first one breaks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you want to be a lean machine. Otherwise, you'll never reach the top, so don't give me too much. If you have too much under the canopy, I promise you, you're going to leave it. If you have too much, you cannot climb the hill of souls. You cannot climb the hill of holiness. Give me today my daily bread. And I tell audiences, don't ask, don't ask for your daily bread. And people say, why not? I said, well, in our American culture, if you ask for your daily bread, and if God honors that uh, prayer, most likely he will take 75% away from you. Oh, I didn't mean that. He said, no, you asked me. Wow. Lord, give me to my daily bread. That's all I need because I want to climb hills. I want to stay under the canopy. I want to climb hills and I don't want to have too much. And if I have more than I need, I give it away. I am generous. Acts 2. They didn't call anything their own. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to give, to, give uh, stuff uh, to people that, don't, that doesn't belong to you? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that's what they do in, uh, in uh, American politics. <laughs> they give everything away. It doesn't belong to them. So it's easy, 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 easy. It's easy to give stuff away from your husband, right? It's easy to give away stuff from your wife, right? Uh, but now your stuff. Wait a minute. Well, what's our stuff? Zero, because everything belongs to him. So if we give stuff away, we give God's stuff away. Well, and then it is very, very easy. All right, now. Evangelism takes place under the leadership of evangelists. We'll talk about that later. Sharing the word takes place under the leadership of the pastor teacher. But your daily food is under the leadership of the deacon. It is the quartermaster of the church who provides the logistics for the evangelist to climb so he doesn't have to uh, look over his shoulders, uh, where does my neck garment come from? And supply the funds for the pastor teacher that he can be 100% in sharing the word. And when you are not able to climb any longer because you're deprived of nearly everything, the deacon gives you just enough so that you can join the evangelist in climbing and you can enjoy, uh, join the pastor teacher in climbing. And then you say to the Lord, Lord, I am not a very good soldier. Forgive me my debts. Wow. As I forgive my debtors, that I know that I am not a very good soldier. I am not going to point a finger somebody else. And Lord, I am not very powerful so Deliver me from the evil one. I am not able to overcome it in my own strength. 
That's humility. Humility that you don't want to have more than you need to claim to stay under the canopy and climb the hills. Humility when you recognize that you're not a very good soldier. As David says, I pour out my heart to share the righteousness of God with a great congregation. But even as is, Lord, more numerous are my iniquities than the hairs of my head. That is humility. And I am not a very powerful soldier. I cannot take on Satan. It's absolutely impossible. I cannot take him on. Every time I'll take him on, I will lose by definition. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And the other day I said to a group of young people, sin is deceitful and Satan schemes. Never, never think too little of him. Because every time he suffers a defeat, he sucks more strength out of it in order to go twice after him. Think of David, Ugh. committing adultery with the wife of his prized soldier Uriah, and then decided to kill him. If God was not a God of mercy and of grace, he would be like Saul, and Peter would have been like Judas. That is our God. But ladies and gentlemen, humility is not the final word. As the King James, the King James Version tells us, for yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. In me, aha, and through me. And all of a sudden, we stay under the canopy and we climb the hill of souls and we climb the hill of holiness. But let me ask you, have you ever heard the Lord's Prayer explained like this? It took me 50 more years before I finally had a hunch that is not a ritual. It must be a reality. That's what we pray for. The first three, the second three, and the final three. Think about it. Ask yourself, in zero and a hundred, if this were a television show, the numbers would get on the screen. Where do you find yourself? You can whisper it to me later on, but I am afraid that we may not get a passing grade, and we should. Now, the Canaanite woman, she graduated from this first school of prayer, because it's a school of prayer. Now you know the story. Her daughter had to, was in trouble. Now, when they go to foreign cultures, and even in her own culture, well, the daughter was sick. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if you're sick, you can go to your savior and he will heal your sickness. Now, incidentally, I don't believe that the, the young woman was sick at all. She was a picture of health. That was not her problem. Demons had invaded her. So she was in spiritual darkness. And what did her mother do? She had an intolerable burden. Get rid of that darkness, O son of David. How in the world does she know that he is the son of David? She was a pagan. She knew only the son of David could drive out the darkness of Satan. And she was in the arena. And she cried out to God, have mercy. <laughs> now mercy in the Bible is only given to people who are terminal. 
Good Samaritan gave mercy. Without the Good Samaritan, the guy would have been dead. The publican needs mercy. Without mercy, he would go to hell. The saints, God's people, need mercy to be holy because without that mercy, we cannot be holy ourselves. We are not going to make it because without holiness, no one can see the Lord. So mercy is always given to terminal people. She knew that her daughter was terminal. And what was Jesus' answer? He ignored her. None whatsoever. I read a psalm the other day, and I felt that David was saying, Lord, you're ignoring me. You're ignoring me. Have you ever thought of that way? You're ignoring me. Sometimes he's just doing that, all right? And then she shouts. And the disciples are wonderful people. You see there, your fellow church members, shut up. <laughs> That's what the church is doing all the time. You're too fanatic. Shut up. Come on, man. I've heard people say that to evangelists who want to go out. Come on, man, slow down. <laughs> Somebody told the father of modern missions, if God wants to, uh, the Gentiles to be saved, he doesn't need you. Stay at home. It's exactly the same thing. William Carroll. And what does Jesus say? No. Wow. Have you ever gotten the impression that Jesus says no? Pastors. Lord, why is there no more effective? It looks like you're saying no. And then the woman goes on her knees. She starts with an intolerable burden. She continues with a sense of despair. If you do not take care of my daughter, it's over. And then she surrenders total, radically and totally. She goes on her knees. Here I am, Lord. And then Jesus explains the no. It says, well, why would I give the bread of children to the dogs? That's not pejorative. No, the dogs are people who do not belong like children to the same to the same family. So I am going to take care of my children, and I am not going to take care of outsiders. As uh, one young man once said to his mother. You gave me a pork chop, Mom. I'm going to feed my dog the pork chop because I love that dog. And then the mother says, no, 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 no. You can feed a dog, but the pork chop is for you, and that is not going to be given to the dog. I love the dog. I feed the dog, but the pork chop is for you. The dog can get other food. And then what Jesus said. You don't belong to the table. And then the woman says, with a smile on her face, Lord, to be very frank, I have never seen a child who does not drop crumbs on the floor. I am going to get my crumbs. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that however dark everything looks, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Is that the way you live? <laughs> Lord, the tunnel is closed. There's no light anywhere, and it will be forever. David at times said, Lord, why have you forsaken me? But then he calls on the name of the Lord and he sees the light coming. And ladies and gentlemen, the woman saw the light. He said, I am going to get my crop in unwavering faith. Have you noticed in the New Testament how often the Lord Jesus says, Your faith has healed you? 
again and again. But now, wait a minute, Lord. Wait, oh, you of little faith, you walk on water and all of a sudden you go right through it. What a faith. And the Lord Jesus heals the daughter immediately, instantaneously. I think of uh, Nehemiah. He hears that uh, there's trouble and shame in Jerusalem. It looks an impossibility to take care of that wall. And when he finally enters into the procedures to get the wall up, it looks like an eternity. Enemies on the outside are trying to kill him. People on the inside who are totally dejected after half and say, we cannot finish it. Sins of people who, who uh, take the girls and the boys from the wall uh, and put them in their slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, it must have looked like an eternity to Nehemiah. And then the wall is finished in 53 days. And that's it. Have you ever noticed that? I've noticed that in my life. This is impossible, Lord. And Lord, it looks like an eternity, Lord. Hey, here's the answer. That's amazing. And God says, no, not amazing. Because it isn't impossible. And it looks like an eternity. But it is not. I'm going to give you an answer. That's the faith that we need. That we ask ourselves a question. Now how can we be in the arena rather than in the stands? You know what I mean? Uh, I was uh, listening to a message on the Canaanite woman and the pastor said, uh, well, see, there was a wonderful woman. Let's applaud her. Okay, now you may go home and uh, eat your dinner. Well, I came to the conclusion that he did not see that this was a school. Woman, you have an intolerable burden, but it's not enough. It's not enough to have an intolerable burden. To get the darkness out, the satanic darkness out of the world. Not enough. You must have a sense of despair if it doesn't happen. And even that is not enough. You must have a total surrender. And even that is not enough. You must have an unwavering faith. Now, how many people graduate from, the, from that second school? You will never graduate from the first school until you graduate from the second school, until you graduate from the first school. And you say to me, well, how, why would I have an intolerable burden? You said, well, uh, are you a mother and a father, huh? You have children, those joyful bundles, right? Of total depravity. <laughs> huh? They don't look that way. There's a young man there who smiles. Well, sir, before you were a father, you were also a little girl, a little boy. And you look at yourself in the mirror of God's word. Do you know that when we talk about the message of evangelism, we go into more detail. But do you know that if my brother pastor and I would be twins, and we would have been conceived one second before the flood. And we would be human beings at that moment. That God would have drowned us too. God drowned everybody. Why do you think he did that? Or oh, he left one man in order to have an opening into the future. A little light at the end of the tunnel. All right? And eventually without Jesus, that light would have been gone. But that's not our subject for tonight. We must understand that if we had lived before the flood, 
God would have drowned every one of us. Because all the thoughts of our hearts were only evil continually. And as I will show you later in the message, the Bible tells us that his heart is wicked and we cannot even know it. And then Psalm 58 tells us that heart is like a cobra. I uh, preached on that in one of our churches not too long ago. And I said uh, to the people, your little children are little cobras. It is darkness. What do you need to do? An intolerable burden for the darkness to be removed. And a sense of despair if it doesn't happen. And a total surrender for it to happen. And an unbelieving faith for it to take place. And there were two ladies in the church and I saw in their faces they ate it up. And after the service, I was sitting down and their little children came and said, hello, little cobra. <laughs> and the mothers smiled. Thank you. Thank you. One of my buddies said to his grandson, you're a little cobra because you kick your brother. And three months later, he said to his dad, dad, may I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. How can I get rid of that cobra? And he told his other grandson, there were two of them, and said, you're a little cobra. He said, oh, Johnny is his brother. <laughs> Aha. The Holy Spirit will convict us before we flee to an everlasting Savior. For ladies and gentlemen, there's darkness in this valley, is there? The darkness is oppressive. We must have an intolerable burden to go to God. We must have a sense of despair if it doesn't disappear. We must have a total surrender to everything. Let me stay under the canopy, let me climb the hill of souls, let me climb the hill of holiness. I'm satisfied with my daily bread. I'm not a very good soldier. I'm not a very powerful soldier. But I thank you, Lord, that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory in me and then through me. Total surrender, unwavering faith. But ladies and gentlemen, the school of evangelism will never take off until they put it in the soil of this kind of prayer. The company in the man. The Lord's Prayer and the prayer of the Canaanite woman. Check yourself. Ask yourself, where do I stand? Zero to one hundred? I asked this to a man in South, South Africa. He said, maybe 25%, 20%, 10%. <laughs> I said, look around. Now you know why you see what you see. I can talk of a storm about the message, the messenger, everything else. But the soil of prayer is there. James says, you don't have because you do not ask. That's where I start. And this is the conclusion of the first segment. And then we hope about the quality of prayer during the second.